computer, share screen, not theory of PowerPoint. Look good, everybody on Zoom. Might help if I gave our class a camera view. Okay. Oh, a little trivia that y'all just thought about when reading the book. Uh, Dr. Tilly had COVID. She had to be hospitalized with it for a couple of weeks. So, just so you know, uh, your micro lecturer and your micro textbook author both have gone through COVID this year. Numbers look good for the school. They actually went down from Friday to today, which means we have less K active cases today than we did Friday, which is surprising. I thought it would go the other way. So that's good. Good news. All right. Nyseria and Moraxillus. Nyseriaceae. A and Moraxillae. ACA. So you know how to spell those. Uh, Nyseria, we have two genera, genus, genus of Nyseriaceae. They're aerobic, gram negative, coxa, and rods. Okay, so here we're switching from we had gram positive, you know, staph and strep, and now we're going to gram negative. So these we pick up red, and we have a couple uh, Nyserias who we're keying in on. King Ella is another. Um, then we're going to do more axelli ACA, which are aerobic gram negative coxine rods, so very similar. More axella is who we're going to key in on, but we do have uh, Centobacter down there. So this is definitely a, um, is a player kind of in the, in the game, but we think more of a surface contaminant uh, in that type deal. Okay, so that's kind of our setup. So if you were using your guide today, you would flip over to the gram negative red side instead of the purple side. And, and I didn't do it in color. It's, colors weren't that important for this. Um, there are a few tests in here that you can see color with, but, but the detail of the names was the key thing. So, so when you see gram negative cocci, if you look way over to the right side, you will see that you have Nyseria gonorrhea and Nyseria meningitidis over there to the right. And if you go on down, you see your Moraxella uh, cataralis there at the bottom. So those are three main ones we're looking at. And you see the difference, we'll test underneath each one, and that's what lecture is about today. So you basically have a little guide to look at. So what makes Nyseria and a gram negative diplococci? So the first question I ask you is, who's our gram positive dipso, diplococci we've already talked about? And we're going to see today at lab. I hope I hadn't looked at them, but they were growing. I set them up last night. Who's our gram positive diplococci? Not to be confused with the Nyseria species of the gram negative diplo. Remember? In the strep lecture. Anybody remember? Arias. Hmm? Is it Arias or is that? No, not Arias. Arias wasn't dip, diplo. It was <coughs> clusters. Coxi clusters. This was a little diplo coxi. Strep pneumo. Ring a bell, maybe. Okay. Strep pneumo doesn't ring a bell. Strep pneumo. Streptococcus pneumoniae that we talk about as a diplococci. If you look on your other side of your little study helper, you see diplococci lancet shape for strep pneumoniae. And we're going to we have them growing downstairs for today. So the habitat, and hopefully, and this is kind of for everybody to say, hopefully you understand or you're starting to see it's one day and done in micro, right? We get an hour and 15 minutes. We kind of like, here's the group. We're on the next group. We move on to the next group. But it's not, we don't spend a week on staff, okay? I mean, more than a week. We're, we're one day, okay? We're doing one lab. So you got to be, be keying in on the differences in these because it's going to, we're just moving. 
Okay, there's too much for us not to be moving through. Morphology, gram-negative diplos, but the habitat of Neisseria mucous membranes and the upper respiratory or and or the urogenital tracts. Okay, so we see them, uh, they can be spread. One of our Neisseria meningitis can be spread with respiratory droplets, and then we have Neisseria gonorrhea spread through the uro, with the uro, urogenital tract. So sexually transmitted. So here's our gram negative stain, and hopefully you can appreciate the diplos, diplococci here, okay? And they sometimes get described as kidney shaped, but you can see there's a diplo. Real close up here, but you see the diplo kind of going. Uh, and this is in yeah, this phagocytic cell here. That's them in here. Ooh, there they are. That is not one there. That's the nucleus. Okay. Oh, and here they are again. Being phagocytized. Have you heard of nice Nasiri gonorrhea? I guess we'll start there. Right? Everybody heard of gonorrhea? What does gonorrhea get associated with? Who, who's worked in the lab? Who's collect, collected um, female specimens? Doesn't have to always be female, but usually it's a routine collection. If we suspect they maybe have something of this kind. Anybody know the other one that comes with it? Is it chlamydia? Chlamydia, exactly. Who said that? Hey, I can't tell. I didn't see any mouse move. I just heard a wolf voice. Yes. GC, so you hear that a lot. So in our practical, hey, we're working in the lab or we're working in the women's clinic and they say, we need to get a GC done on this patient. That stands for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Okay, so those are two. Okay, chlamydia is a, a different thing we'll get to later, but just wanted to make sure you knew those two uh, were associated with, um, you know, female collection, if you want to say, um, if they suspect a sexually transmitted um, infection, all right, they can do those. So we used to get a lot of, they called them GC probes, okay. We did a DNA probe with that. They take the swab and they put it in a solution and get sent off and then they would do a, a DNA amplification looking for DNA of both of those organisms. Okay. So Nyseria, uh, we need to process immediately because Neisseria is, is very sensitive to drying out and temperature extremes. And I didn't, let's see. I was looking to see if the chat, chat box, sometimes the chat box is here, not here. I don't see it. So definitely Zoom, if y'all need to ask something, say it out loud. Usually I, I may or may not be able to see the chat box. I think some people have made comments in the past, but I hadn't seen them. So drying out temperature extremes, there is an oxygen requirement. So we get to do a little oxygen quiz for you. So if not serious species are obligate arrows, mean what? What does obligate mean? Strict, right? Yes. Facultative, yay, I can do with do it with it with it or without it. But if they're obligate aerobes, they have to have what? There's little or no growth without oxygen. Okay. Then we come right back and we say, well, Nasiri gonorrhea and meningitis, the ones we're gonna look at today, require increased CO2 levels. So we got a cat no filling. We're gonna get to see our little a candle jar that we that we're using today, even for our straps downstairs. We're going to do this again for next week when we do our nice series. There we go. So there's our candle jar. 3% carbon dioxide environment when I burn my little candle in there. I got my plates down here, got my top on, that's my pickle jar. Like I said last week, you remember the dill pickles that are sitting on the counter? 
at the convenience store and you get somebody to grab you one, that's what we use as clean them out. They work great for that. Temperature requirement for Neisseria, optimum growth 35 to 37. That's, that's perfect, that's what we're looking for. That's what we have our incubator set for. And again, just so you, just reminder, that's what, what's 37 degrees Celsius? Body temperature. Body temperature, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Okay. Yes, because we our optimum growth, organisms like to grow like they're infecting us, like they've already infected us, and they're set up to grow at 98 point whatever. Well, some of you are 93 normal body temp, right, according to our little thermometer downstairs. Neisseria meningitis is very sensitive to cold. We never refrigerate the specimen. That's key. I mean, like, okay, so we got this patient having problems and what where does this play in real life anybody want to take a shot storing cold sample stored in cold how could that happen how could that happen without us knowing who's working anybody working in a hospital probably to have some people working in the hospital so we get some cultures done. They get ordered, right? But they may not get done right away. Lab's not around. Well, we put urine in the fridge, right? So why don't we put everything in the fridge? Well, that's how that culture app would get put in the fridge without us knowing it. Okay. So they take the culture, right? Put it in the refrigerator. Okay. Incubation period, this is Neisseria gonorrhea, requires 24 to 72 hours for good growth. So maybe a little longer, okay? So what is our normal? What's our normal? What did y'all learn in intro, micro? What's our normal growth time? What did you learn last week when we grew things out? 24 to 48. 24 to 48, right. So, May or may not, right? May or may not. We do two days, actually. We might even go longer. We might go three days with that. Okay, so normally, we, if we get a urine, right? We culture it, right? We plate it. We plate it out. We put that plate in the incubator overnight. We bring it out. We look at it, right? It may or may not be ready to roll. Might not have enough growth, but we keep it one more day. Right, we do two days, so we'll do a, a no growth one day, no growth two days, or no growth 24, no growth 48. So we keep them 48 hours, but if it was a female specimen or a male gonorrhea specimen, and we knew it was, then we keep it that third day. Okay, we might we go a little longer keeping it just to make sure we didn't miss a growth. Okay, so that's the real life putting it together for Nyseria. Now this is real neat because this is, can be helpful and it can be harmful for your setting up growth for these. So far we've set up staph and strep, right? I put those on blood auger. Uh, I think we brought out an E. coli the first day. We had that on McConkey. Okay, so we're, we're looking at negative growth again, right? We're looking at gram negatives, right? And that's what we are, we're gram negative, right? So who have we seen so far that's gram negative out of everything we've done? First day, right? Conky. E. coli, right? Okay. We hadn't seen much of the negatives. But this one's a little, this is different because not, this is not going to grow as our normal growth. We're not going to see this on a blood auger plate needs more. So what they're saying with the gonorrhea is it's very deciduously grows. It requires enriched media as chocolate auger. So chocolate auger, that next auger that we hadn't played with. Have we played with chocolate yet? So what do we have on chocolate? Anything? We did a staff on chocolate. 
Well, now I see where you're going to really need chocolate because it needs that chocolate is supplemented with growth factor. So we have some meningitis is going to be got gonorrhea, meningitis, good growth on chocolate and blood auger. Okay, saprophytic does not require blood. We won't worry about the saprophytic, it's a different name. But we're going to see better growth where? Chocolate and auger. Remember that. Okay. Here's the saprophytic. It's growing on blood. Okay. I think that's blood auger, right? Looks like it's pretty cool looking. Self-explanatory. Isolated from a nasal pharynx. And, and we know that one now, right? That one from our COVID-19 testing. Who's got the nasal pharynx culture, right? Culture that goes up in your nose and you're gonna bring it out. Oral pharynx is back of the throat. So back throat or urogenital. So from um, Females and males, urogenitals, and one thing we'll say, and we like to say this with males, usually if something's going on here, males go right to the doctor, right? There's not very many males have something oozing out, right? Or this, what is this? They're going to go to the doctor to find out. But we know females sometimes, uh, well, that's just, just sometimes we don't know, okay? So the chances of chlamydia infection going untreated okay, or a Neisseria infection going untreated, it can happen because, you know, just, I don't know if there's something, it's not, it's not really right. Maybe it's change, but, you know, I'm not going to run and go get help. So sometimes we see a lot of this in the ER. Right, they come in for some other painful reason, like lower abdominal pain, okay? Really hurts, lower body hurts, and we end up taking a culture from that. So a pelvic exam, culture through, see the discharge, see the reason we were there in the first place. Males usually, you know, doc, there's something going on. This is not normal. So we, we see that in the two different sexes of our patients. All right, so I talked about what makes the chocolate auger even better. Okay, so we start off with chocolate auger. We know Nyseria grows best on chocolate auger. But we can also help keep other things from growing on the chocolate auger. Okay. So we have these, they're called modified Thayer Martin, and they look just like the chocolate plate, but we call them uh, MTM plates. And what they have, and what should we ask on the exam number one, I will ask you what makes Thayer Martin different and what keeps other things you would think you would see from a swab, from a urogenital area, from growing, okay? So the first thing is we have vancomycin in there. We've heard of vanc, hopefully. Vancomycin is our you know, big, big antibiotic that we give for our MRSA patients, which we learned last week. So vancomycin is in there, Martin, and it prevents gram-positive bacteria, right? So that's why we would we'd associate with Staph aureus. Staph aureus is gram-positive, right? And it would keep that. The Thayer Martin is not going to grow Staph aureus. Or staph epi, right? Colistin, which is another antibiotic, right? Inhibits gram negative rods. 
So I didn't, we hadn't got there yet, but we did the gram stain, right, on E. coli, gram negative rods, our E. coli gram stain for our gram negatives. That's why we had the Maconti out. It inhibits the gram negative and the saprophytic Neisseria that we saw growing in that weird looking colony, right? That big puffy white thing that looks like, you know, looking at mountain tops. We have Nystatin, inhibits yeast, we know that. Because we know we treat yeast infections with not statin. If you didn't, now you know. So we don't get any yeast growth, which you would think from a urogenital area, you might have a yeast. Colistin, from gram negatives, but E. coli could be there, it's not growing. Vancomycin, no staph's gonna be growing on the Thayer Martin. And then we have trimethoprim, lactate, which prevents swarming of the proteus. The proteus is that one that swarms over the entire plate, covers up everything if it's there, and it just makes a big mess and stinks. Okay, and we're going to see proteus later. So we can keep all of that from growing on our Thayer Martin, and that hopefully will help us isolate whether we have Neisseria or not. So if we suspected we had a Neisseria infection, then we definitely would go to Thayer Martin overnight, next night, and just see if we had a colony pop up. Because if it pops up, it's pretty indicative that we've got not serious growing. Nothing else is going to grow, I think. And so it's definitely a great media, selective media, to select out for uh, not serious. So it's with those that will be the little round discs for the No, they're mixed in. They're added to the, the, the auger. Agar. Yeah, we we swap we put that inside the auger and poured it a whole plate. It's all mixed in there. So that colony that that specimen's put on top of that and it just doesn't grow. It tries to take up and those antibiotics are there. It just it keeps everything from growing up. I don't know if that was a stupid question. That's just what I remember. But thinking of disc, we are using discs today. And we'll tell the disc story down in the lab, but we were searching for the discs this morning, and we searched everywhere. We were in the fridge for I don't know how long, and we went in the closet actually, and we finally found the, the, what we were looking for, but in a different form. And then I just happened to open the freezer door, and there was what I've been looking for all morning, our discs. So we got some discs that we're gonna set up today, and I'll show you, we're gonna do that. So you're definitely gonna get to apply those and see how those work for strep. But this is all mixed into the Thayer Martin, and we have Thayer Martin, which we'll use next week with this lab. So here's a chocolate, okay? It's not Thayer Martin, it's just chocolate, Neisseria gonorrhea growing. So this is, you know, where it's gonna grow best is on the chocolate auger. You're gonna see it, right? And hopefully nothing else is around. So this is a pure culture of Neisseria gonorrhea. Very good streaking for isolation, just banging on out there. Up close and personal. And what we're gonna do is compare the gonorrhea with the meningitis, okay, on chocolate. So definitely these slides can make their appearance back on the midterm when we get back to it. You know, this is kind of the thing I'll put up and go, this organism grows well on chocolate. This is from a urogenital collection. Uh, and give all the hints and stars that we have for this organism, and then you'll have to pick out from this the pictures to aid you. You have a description that'll go with it. This is Neisseria gonorrhea on Thayer Martin or Martin Lewis. This is Martin Lewis, so it's not kind of the same kind of concept, right? We got media down here that's Martin Lewis. We got. Um, gonorrhea and chlamydia, lectin, and New York City auger. Okay, so, but we're using Thayer Martin. So gonorrhea here on chocolate, gonorrhea on Thayer Martin. Gonorrhea on, on Thayer Martin, kind of looks the same, right? Not much difference, and just nice little colony. Now, if we took that, Let's, let's back up and see how we would do it. We had this growing. We came in and we had a Thayer Martin growing. We knew it's a Neisseria, right? And we did a gram stain. What would our gram stain look like from this place? What should I see? 
red uh, cock's eye. Just a cock's eye or? Diplo uh, Diplo cock's eye. Are they diplo? Uh, Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you, Zoom and Lauren. All right. Now, Siri gonorrhea, we can do different things. We can do a direct smear. Um, sex of the patient, sexual practices, clinical presentation. You know, we're not doing this. You know, we're, we're not taking this history. We're not figuring out if this person really needs a GC or a gonorrhea. We're, we're not, right? This is just given to us and say, hey, we need to, we need to check this patient for Neisseria gonorrhea. Males, the urethral specimen collected using a calcium alginate swab, not cotton. So, and, and this is kind of like the word, the caution of the day. We've gotten so many of these little clear weight kits around now. Be careful, careful that you know exactly what you're collecting with because the kits are designed to collect with certain things and not just cotton swab that we happen to find in a jar in the exam room. Okay. It may work. It should work. But sometimes we're asked to use different swabs. Okay. And this one for the male urethral specimen is a calcium alginate swab, not cotton. And we see this a lot with strep, okay? Strep swab, well, I did a throat swab for you. Could you not use that? That's what I get from nurse A a lot. I'm like, no, I need to be rayon. The kid had a rayon swab and we can't use cotton. We needed a rayon swab. What's the difference? Well, the rayon is designed to pick up the antigen of the strep a little better than it is for regular cotton. Might work, maybe work, it could work, right? But it's not designed. The kit's designed with rayon swabs, not cotton swabs, okay? And rayon's a synthetic, it's not a cotton. That's the kind of thing that you need to be. You're, the, you're the, that person. You're gonna be that person that has to say, this is what we need. So you got to educate. You got to take your little rayon swabs and say, I need these and they need these labeled for strep throat or strep collection. These are the ones we want to use because the nurse thinks they're helping. You. They think they're helping you out. They go ahead and got the throat swab. They just grabbed whatever was in the little sterile packaging, kind of like ours the other day in lab, right? We had those two little cotton swabs and a little pack. They'll just grab those and do it, right? And those are great for culture, throat culture, but we can't use those for the kits. The kits are designed to work with the special little swabs. Symptomatic presence of intracellular gram-negative diplococci is what we'll see within the cytoplasm of pus cell that's collected. It's considered diagnostic. So we can just take that. We may be asked to do some of this. We might be asked to confirm. What did you see? Did you do a could you do a smear with this and tell me what we got, okay? Well, if you don't remember that it's diplococci, then what good are, well, can't do this, right? Because you just do a smear and you go up. Oh, saw something in there, right? Asymptomatic patient, organism may be few, gram stain may be not sensitive enough to detect it, and culture is recommended with smears are negative. So the smear is the step, first step, then we go to culture, you know, when'd you get this? We don't know, you know, your ER doc that you're working with may or may not do that. Your, your OBGYN doc will probably be a little more aggressive and maybe just go ahead and say, we're, we got to send off this culture or we're doing a culture or we're doing that G, GC DNA probe to make sure this patient, but I'm pretty sure 99.9% .9 that we already, we have not serious gonorrhea. So you may be asked to do some confirming. You may be asked to do some culturing, okay? So basically what this is is what? A negative smear, okay? We see a bunch of white cells, but we don't see any bacteria. We put this one up. For those that are going into 
clinical, when you do your clinical, this is part of the clinical review. This is it. I put this slide up and I go, what do y'all see? And they go, well, some gram negative. Uh, I'm not real sure. It's been a while. That's the, that's the go-to answer when you do the clinical review. It's, it's been a while, Mr. Director, since I've had the class. And then when I put this one up there, they go, oh yeah, yeah, now I see it. Now I see all the, the little diplococci. Is that gram negative again? Yes, right? So you see these what neutrophils are eating the uh, diplococci there. And that's what we were, we'll, we'll wait and do this lab later, but this is what we're going to try to uh, repeat. We're going to try to make your smear look like this. And hopefully we'll see some intracellular bacteria being phagocytized. Nasiri gonorrhea, homosexual men, direct smears are not recommended for rectal and throat swabs because of a saprophytic species, results may be misleading. Here's a rectal smear. I don't think I've ever done a rectal smear of looking for any Neisseria, but you never know. And this has got a different look to it, right? For those of my Diplo, or this is the Diplo here, right? Being phagocytized, so there's other bacteria. That's why I would never do a rectal smear. You would have a ton of other bacteria. With a female, we do an endocervical or urethral or rectal specimen. Direct smears are less symptomatic or less sensitive. And then we have this microbiota, saprophytic species is indistinguishable from gonorrhea. So an endocervical smear, the key to take home here is that you recognize the diplococci inside the white cells, diplo, diplo, diplo. Anorectal infections, even in the absence of the anal intercourse, in the absence of anal intercourse, are due to contamination of the perineal region, exudate from the vagina, rectal cultures may be positive. So let's just say that there is a variety of different patients, different sexual activity that could be um, indicated for doing cultures at different places, okay. depending on what was going on. It's not always urogenital or rectal. It could be others. And we're going to see some of that in just a minute when I say got some pictures for you to see. So here's our Thayer Martin. This is a nice series. So Thayer Martin knocks out all of this. This is a great example of what a Thayer Martin can do. Remember, it's vancomycin. Nystat. Holistin. Is there another one? Vanco, nystatin, listen, was there four or three? How many were there? There was four. There was four. I specifically named those two names. Which one? I don't know how to say that. Uh, Give it a shot. Trying to throw friend, lactate. So, yeah, that was something. What, say it one more time. Trying to throw friend. Trimethoprim. That. Yeah, trimethoprim. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there was four. That's kind of a little review for you. Thayer Martin. Definitely we'd say, oh look, we if we had this, right? We're just we're just in a uh no. Not doing anything with that. That's way too much. That's way too many different things over here. But if we had Thayer Martin, we don't miss it. We'd miss it over here. If we're just doing chocolate only, we're missing it. Okay, we're not setting this up. We're setting this up. When we transport for Nasiri gonorrhea, transport media can be used long periods of time that are required to transport specimens. And this media, so there's a transport media that you would need to put your culture in. And it's called Transgrow, which has Thayer Martin media under CO2 atmosphere, gym back plates contain CO2 generating tablets. This is kind of info for you, but this is you, right? 
hey, we got to send one of these off, right? We don't do micro here anymore, Baptist, right? We need to send that off. So do we have the correct stuff? Do we have the correct transport? Or we just, we're going to freeze it, right? We're going to put it in the refrigerator? No, we're not, right? So when you read room temp, right, you better leave it at room temp. Don't let your courier walk in and throw everything in his icebox. If you've got a potential for a Nyseria culture, okay? I have a question. Yes. It's kind of off topic a little bit, but do we not have like an AEL office carrier system thing in Johnsonville? Is yes. It? Okay. Yes. Is that just for... There's no test. There's very limited testing. I don't think they do any. I don't know if they do testing there at all. I was hoping for it. You were hoping for it? It's right there by Red Cross. Next time I go over there, I think yeah. I'll walk in and just say, hey, let me yeah. see. But it was during, I yeah. seen it the other day when I was going to Yeah, but the little little cars that run around mm -hmm. usually pick up. But they do have regional labs that do some testing. Like they could pick up from area and then have some done in-house right there. Take it to that place. But most everything gets driven over to Memphis. That's the big lab. Huge. Yeah. Huge. Okay. Now, Siri gonorrhea, we talked about the transport. Here's some, you know, ancient pictures showing you that. And that is our transgrow media. Okay. So you would go ahead and plate your swab basically to transport it. Do very, we do some of that. Okay. We, um, gram stain and direct smears, the kidney bean diplococci. It says to be cautious that some other gram organisms may have that gonococcus look. They're not diplo, but they look like they're diplo. Okay. So again, our direct smear, we're looking at loaded up neutrophils. Oh, this is a gonorrhea on the chocolate plate again. So here's our test. So we've, we've done site, we've done smears, we've done gram staining. Now we have Nyseria gonorrhea in a biochemical reaction. And this is where our, you know, our little API strip comes in. This is when our microscan panel comes in because we're going to do these little biochemical tests. But we don't need that for oxidase. Oxidase is just swipe it, put it on a cotton swab, drop some uh, uh, developer on there, and it darkens up, right? Does a, and we're going to do oxidase next week. Okay, so we've had catalase, remember, which did the, put the hydrogen peroxide to see if it produced catalase. This is to see if this organism produces oxidase. Okay, so it's a difference. It's a difference. So we're going to do that little development. So we do that with Nyseria gonorrhea. So if you had something growing on chocolate, it didn't come up the first day you were growing it, but it came up the second day, and you wanted to check it for oxidase real quick, you just swab it, get your little, little file, break it. Put a drop on there, look at it, and it turns purple. Okay. Carbohydrate utilization, meaning the only sugar that's being fermented is glucose. So all those sugars we did uh, last week with staff, there we had glucose and mannose and fructose, and we kept going, right? Well, if it's Nyseria, gonorrhea, the only one that's going to turn yellow is glucose. First one, first positive, you know, our positive control is a glucose fermenter, and none of the others are all going to be red going the other way. So that's key things to remember: is oxidase positive, and it's on your little sheet. Well, study guide says diplococci oxidase turning purple. They're small, kidney shaped. They grow on Thayer Martin with CO2, and gonorrhea, glucose ferment, gram stain. Um, about it so far. So we're doing okay. So we're going to see a difference in meningitis, and that is we have a different glucose plus somebody else. I didn't get that. Oops, sorry. Checking the time, and she thinks I'm wrong. So. All right. So we have other ways of doing tests. 
we can do a coagulation. We can do a commercial kit for Nicere gonorrhea, which means we're going to use a, an antibody test and look for agglutination of the, the organism with its antibody. Fluorescent monoclonal antibody test. So these are, you know, test kits or we would do immunoassays and we can do those right away. So we can actually screen for Nicere gonorrhea in the clinic, in the hospital um, to let us know if we had a positive. With using immunoassay technique and we're going to learn all about that immunology and we still have a few here that aren't going to be in immunology so they already know this. Direct fluorescent antibody and the enzyme uh, immunoassay. So here's a fluorescent. Okay, so if you had a fluorescent scope, which they're not that hard, we have one over an ABI. Um, so we have one on campus. If you wanted to develop these and look for the diplococci. So here's diplo, here's a neutrophil. I hope you can see that, right? So we're actually looking at the organism under a fluorescent antibody test, lighten it up. So then we get into why is gonorrhea one of our highlights of today's lecture. 820,000 new gonorrhea infections reported each year in the United States. That's a lot, right? A lot. Um, gonorrhea is the second most commonly reported infectious disease after chlamydia. So the GC, the chlamydia and gonorrhea duo, are number one and two, right, in reportables. And you have to report this, and who can tell me what that means? If it's a reportable disease, what do we do? Tell the CDC. What was that? Is that Lauren again? Do you tell the CDC about them? Well, you don't have to go all the way to the CDC. But you got to go to the health department. You got to report it to the Arkansas Department of Health first. They'll say they'll give it to CDC. Okay, so we get these numbers. Since it's a reportable, if we get a positive Nasiri gonorrhea, we have to report that to the health department that we have one. Okay, why? Guess what they're going to do? Contact tracing. You know that was that was hip with gonorrhea before COVID which is you got to find these sexual partners of this person and let them know that you got to, like then with patient A who has a sexually transmitted disease and they need to come in and get treatment. Okay, so you try to cut off the spread of this just like you would the other infection. Uh, female primarily in the endocervix, increased vaginal discharge, burning, frequent urination, abdominal menstruation. So this may be you know, not that abnormal for some, okay? Some have excessive vaginal discharge, some have burning on urination, and just, right? Oh, that's just a UTI kind of showing itself again. You know, my menstrual cycle hadn't been normal anyway, so, you know, what's, what's it doing, you know, every week or every other week? Um, that's what we're talking about. But look at this, asymptomatic cases in females, 25 to up to 80% of the cases could be asymptomatic. And then we could have pelvic inflammatory disease, and this is where the gonorrhea spreads out, right? It affects the uterus, the fallopian tubes, the peritoneal cavity, uh, may result in an ectopic pregnancy, PID with not serious gonorrhea. The male can shorten it up, right? Primary infection, urethra, symptoms, yellow, purulent discharge, and I'm not happy, doc. Something is amiss, right? Something is wrong. This is not normal. What is wrong with me, right? So we have some pictures, and you know, the suspected infection areas is one thing, it's the unsuspected areas that is like, ugh, alarming sometimes. So endocervix, you know, vaginal discharge, female patient, gonorrhea, male, 
you know, something's not right, Doc. Something that's not normal. But an eye. These are the uncommon areas. Gonorrhea has gotten to the eye of the patient. Not good. And these are adults, but we also have to think about kids, neonates. And some of that I was telling you about to coming through the birth canal when we were looking for uh, group B strep, right? And doing the strep lecture. Now we're looking at maybe a Neisseria gonorrhea infected mom and the baby has to come through the birth canal. And then what they're going to use is silver nitrate or erythromycin. And that's the goop that they put on the eyes as they come out, right? When they're working them up, getting them ready. So we definitely don't want the babies infected. That's why we try to screen moms before birth. But we know not all moms get screened. Uh, if you've worked any time in the ER, that might be the first time they're getting screened. They come in in labor. And don't be surprised. So here is definitely infection. The anal rectal infection, intercourse homosexual males, but you know, we don't put homosexual there. We put normal sexual partner, um, you know, anal sex is not exclusive for males. Okay. Pharyngeal through oral genital sex. Most infections there are asymptomatic. Disseminated gonococcal infections. This is spread, right? You got a gonococcal infection in the urogenital genital area, but your blood and your joints are being infected. Okay, so we might have hand and wrist being infected. Eyes, knee joints, ankles or skin, that's skin, I guess, skin infections. So how do we treat it? We treat it with penicillin. The magic of penicillin is the drug of choice unless it's determined to be resistant to Neisseria gonorrhea, and that's never a good thing. You ever hear anything like penicillin resistant Neisseria gonorrhea outbreak in a area? And we know that beta lactamase is the enzyme being produced by the Neisseria gonorrhea that fights off penicillin, right? Remember that? I think we talked about beta lactamase earlier in the unit. So, this is from 2016. A new strain of antibiotic resistant gonorrhea had shown up. Uh, so, it's the most commonly sexually transmitted disease. We can usually, you know, give it with penicillin. Now, they recommend just not penicillin, but we'll give it ceftriaxon as another antibiotic, along with azithromycin. And that's the popular z pack uh, If you've heard of that antibiotic, if you're a, if you are a connoisseur of antibiotics, you've probably had the z pack Okay, so we see here z pack a lot with um, upper respiratory illnesses, um, and doctors look for that. So we got this is a uh, Dr. Katz from Hawaii. They found a new gonorrhea super strain in routine testing. There were mutations, six men and one woman tested, had no connection to one another. It's not fully resistant, yet all seven people were cured by the regime of ceftriaxone and azithro. But in the lab, gonorrhea bacteria showed its first sign of evolving resistance. So it's one of those, definitely reportable, get the contact tracing done. And so we can find everybody that might be infected. So that infection doesn't spread and we don't give that organism what time to set up for resistance, right? To mutate into something that we don't have treatment for. So meningitis, next one. So we got a specimen type. This is gonna be our cerebral spinal fluid or blood. We can also do nasal pharyngeal swabs to detect the asymptomatic carrier of Neisseria meningitis. And we have round, smooth, glistening, gray, loose, translucent, becomes rubbery with age. So where do we see this? We could see this today on campus, okay? 
they'll say, we're starting to see a bunch of patients with meningitis, right, in the dorm setting. And we kind of have forgotten about what? We've kind of forgotten that there's other illnesses still today. Just, we can't, you know, hey, nothing else is going to happen this year except one infection, but we can definitely see. So you see the difference between meningitis and gonorrhea on the chocolate plate, okay? Definitely a different look, a bigger, larger, flatter maybe, spread out a little more colony than the two of the, right? You can go back, can I go back too far? I see it, right? Dun -dun. So if you saw those side by side, could you pick out which one is meningitis, right? Hopefully. Here's meningitis on Martin Lewis. And this is specialized, kind of like Thayer Martin. That's the exudate from male urethral. All right, we also can do serological testing with meningitis. And we see a difference, right? Oxidase positive, just like who? Gonorrhea. Carbohydrate utilization. Glucose, just like gonorrhea, but we have an additional one. And it's real easy to put the two together because this is meningitis. And luckily for us, the sugar starts with an M. Maltose. So we have two sugars we can get energy from and ferment these. So when we do the test strip on this one, if you just have glucose, then you're probably going to say I have gonorrhea. If you have glucose and maltose turning yellow, you would say you have meningitis. So that's the key to remember. And at the end of this lecture, you'll see kind of a study guide too that we have. This is a table where we put them all up there together with all these different positives and minuses. We can do a latex agglutination test using cerebral spinal fluid or serum and urine. And what they're doing is detecting the capsular antigen of the meningitis. So meningitis would have a capsule. And we can stereotype them into groups of A, B, C, D, E, X, Y, and a W of 135. We have carriers, but we have transmission is through respiratory aerosols, coughing, sneezing, close contact with families, or you're in your college dorm. Crowded conditions. Are your dorms crowded? Because I went on a tour the other day and they're like, oh no, they're not crowded because you have a suite, you have suite mates. And like, Nobody lives in the dorm? No. Not anymore. Okay. But we see it with outbreaks, usually in August, September, when everybody comes back to campus and you get together in a dorm and you're hanging out together all semester. You're not yet. Colonization, usually asymptomatic, mild upper respiratory tract infection, common cold. But what we do see is with the clinical significance of children under a year old septicemia and meningitis. Okay, so this is one of our big ones as far as causing meningitis in the children, babies, symptoms, fever, chills, muscle pains, petechial rash, headaches, stiffness. Okay, and I'm just going to give you, I think I have time to tell my story of petechial rash. I don't think y'all heard this story. So my son is throwing up all one night. And my, you know, we gotta take him, we don't know if he's got what he's got. We just know he threw up. So we take him to the pediatrician the next morning. And everything checks out. Probably just, you know, normal sick stomach, kind of flu virus, virus, whatever you want to call it. But the pediatrician noticed that he had some petechia 
underneath his chin. He said, yeah, that's usually from growing up, straining, dry, heaving, and the blood comes up to the capillaries and makes a rash, a petechial rash. But he said, you know, if the petechial rash is in the legs, around the ankles, that could indicate not serious meningitis. So we got sent to Le Bonner's ER, got to spend a night in Le Bonner for one night for a growing up episode. He did not have meningitis. They did blood cultures, but the doctor was, what, being cautious as to you don't want to mess around with missing a meningitis. And then he goes home and starts running a high fever, goes into a coma and dies. And you were like, well, I just had a pediatrician yesterday. What happened? You know, well, I missed it. I missed the infection. So just to give you an idea of what petechial rash, that's just red capillary rash or red spots. In phlebotomy, you see it when you tie a tourniquet. Sometimes they get the petechiae on their skin and you know they might bleed more, right? You have to hold pressure a little longer after you take off the tourniquet. Another, another example of petechiae rash. Uh, Waterhouse and Frischen, Fred, Fred Friderson's syndrome is a meningococcal anemia, septicemia, and also disseminated intravascular coagulation. And Ms. Ms. Bettner's going to be very proud of y'all when y'all know exactly what that means because we've had it over the second time we've had it, right? Meaning that the patient can't clot their blood, right? Y'all know what that is now. If untreated, the patient may die. Susceptible to penicillin, meningitis is, although there's decreasing in that susceptibility, but rarely is it beta lactamase produced. Direct fluorescent antibody testing, looking for that capsule, right? Binding to the capsule, the fluorescence is held on the antibody. Any questions? Well, that was quick for meningitis, right? That's a big one. That's a bad one, but we spent more time on gonorrhea. And now we're going to finish up with more axilla cataralis. And what we see here is what? We're on blood auger. What do we got to do? We got to drop that temperature. We're on TSA, triptic soy auger, we stay at 37 degrees. But if we got our blood auger, then we got to drop it down. Nitrate reduction, positive. Okay, that's, a, that's indicative of more axilla. And they're unable to produce acid from carbohydrate utilization, which makes them asaccharolytic. And then we have a DNA test, which we're detecting D and A, which is an enzyme that breaks down DNA, and they're positive for it. Now this will fill out our chart. This is more axilla on a blood auger, chocolate auger. There's the diplococcide, gram negative. I hope you can start appreciating these, these, little, these are great stains. I mean, these are great slots. Which mine can look that good. This one, this Moraxella, causes otitis media and sinusitis, so ear infection. Inner ear infection and sinusitis, especially in the immunocompromised elderly, we can get pneumonia, but infrequently causing meningitis. And most times when we think otitis media, we think meningitis capable. But with more axella, it's not, it's not infrequently. It can't, doesn't mean it can't happen, but it's probably not going to happen. So here's our go-to, put them all on the chart for us so we can study, Mr. Director, please. I need to know this. And as you see, we distinguish diarrhea gonorrhea with glucose positive, nothing else, right? Thayer Martin, yes. Nicere meningitis, we've added maltose to the sugar fermentation. Nothing else except Thayer Martin. We have cataralis.
else? We're going to skip the other. These would be our saprophytics. So we'll just skip the cateralis, keep it. And we see that it is that A, what was it again? Any, can't use carbohydrates. What's that called? A, that one big long word. What was it? A, carbohydrate, not can't do carbos, right? What was that word? And you can't ferment any of that. Can't, can't what was it again? A, Sac saprophytic? A sacrophytic, right? A sacrophytic. And you see that. Okay? But you don't you don't see Thayer Martin here, it's gonna knock it out, right? So Thayer Martin is definitely selective, and we see the DNA there at the end for more axella. Okay. So again. Start getting used to this. Okay, we're three into the semester. We've had staff, we've had strep, and now we've had Nyseria. Okay, and we've got uh, one more before test. Is that right? Thursday and then test. Tuesday, is that right? Yes, that's the schedule. I think it's just five units on the first test. I think. We'll double check. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, we'll see you downstairs. See y'all later, Zoom family. We're going to stop the share. Stop the lecture. Oh, we did have a chat. Hey, I couldn't see my chat box. Okay. You're in GC, what happens all the time there? Okay. Great. In the meeting.